So welcome to Just Jesus, week 28, Matthew part 26. We're continuing our deep dive through the entire New Testament, book by book, verse by verse, and we're doing it in 20-minute message chunks, and we're still working our way slowly through Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. We've said uh, several weeks in a row that it's a toe-stomping, tough love sermon for the committed followers of Jesus. It's not for the seeking, wondering crowds. It's for people who have already said, I, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm, I'm going to follow you. And so Jesus is raising the bar here for what it means to be his disciple. And two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus's command to not worry, to instead pursue God's kingdom and God's righteousness, trusting that he's going to meet all of our needs. And then you may remember, he turned the topic of conversation to this idea of not judging others for their sins. And he talked really quickly about what our proper motivation should be. So let's look at Matthew 7 verses 1 through 2. Let's quickly remind ourselves of these two verses because it was two weeks ago. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For with the judgment you are judging, you will be judged. And with the measurement you are measuring, you will be measured. And we remember we said the first three words of verse 1, do not judge, are often misused. They're often taken out of context to assume we should never be allowed to call anything a sin. And we should never be allowed to tell someone what they're doing is a sin. And we said that's such a prevalent, such an incorrect thought. It takes place both within the church body, but also outside of the church and we said it's such a big deal that we're actually going to double down on these two verses this week. I'm going to preach a whole second sermon on it, and we're going to come at this misconception uh, from a different direction this week. I just realized I left my pointer over here, and we want to make sure you guys are seeing these message uh, uh, links as well. So, uh, we said last week, this is not at all what the greater message of the Bible says. We said instead Jesus was cautioning us to not be harsh to not be callous, to not be unforgiving, to not be condemning in our judgment of others. In fact, we took a week off last week and we talked about kindness expressed as tenderness, just to really bring that whole idea together. So Jesus wasn't saying we can't call a sin a sin. Instead, Jesus was saying, he was always teaching, treat others the way you want to be treated. So be kind if you want others to be kind to you. Be gentle if you want others to treat you gently. Be forgiving if you want others to forgive you. Show mercy. Be gracious. Speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. And so I mentioned two weeks ago, the Bible absolutely does not issue one be-all, end-all command to never judge anything or anyone, period. That's just not what Jesus meant. And the problem is many people have ripped that verse out of context, and typically it's to justify their own sinful behaviors. There are actually many times in Scripture that we are commanded to judge. And so we're going to look at a couple of those today. There are many of them, we're just going to look at two of them today. So the first one's in 1 Corinthians. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and the people there have actually been very prideful about several sinful situations in their church. They're just really prideful that we've got freedom in Christ, and so we can sin our brains out all we want, and it's not a big deal. That was kind of the way they were approaching it, and Paul wrote to set them straight and to tell them, no, sometimes I'm going to have to tell you judging is appropriate. So here's what Paul says. He says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. He says, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters. If you did that, you'd have to go out of the world. If you're going to avoid anybody who ever sins, you'd have to leave this planet, Paul says. So he's not talking about that. He says, but actually I wrote to you to not associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or a covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. You shouldn't even sit down and eat dinner with somebody like that. For what have I to do with judging outsiders, Paul says? Do you not judge those who are within the church? And the way he writes this in the original Greek assumes a positive answer. If somebody read this in the original Greek, they know the answer to this question is yes. Do you not judge those who are within the church? Well, yeah, absolutely. Of course we do, is the way they would have read it, right? He says, but those who are outside, God judges. But you remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Okay, so that's what he tells the church in Corinth. And he's very clear here. 
that Christians are not supposed to judge those who are sinning outside the body of Christ. God will take care of that. But Christians are, in fact, supposed to judge one another's sin within the body of Christ. In fact, he lists a few sins that he says we're not even to, supposed to eat meals with people who are doing these things. We're not even supposed to associate in any way with people who profess to be Christians, and yet they're continuing to practice these kinds of specific sins. So when we read that, we say, well, is Paul condemning those people? Is he being disobedient to Jesus's words in Matthew 7 to not judge, to not condemn? And the answer is no, because again, the greater idea of condemnation in Christianity relates to our eternal destination. Don't judge lest you be judged. Don't condemn lest you be condemned. I can't condemn you to hell. You can't condemn me to hell. I can't usher you into heaven either, and you can't usher me into heaven. We don't have that authority. Only God does. And in the greater context of Scripture, Paul also tells us this disassociation with sinning brothers and sisters in the body of Christ was actually with the intended purpose of showing them the danger of their sin. The big picture was that was supposed to help them repent of their sin by hopefully making them miss the fellowship of their brothers and sisters in Christ. If I'm not allowed to come to church because of my sin, if I'm gone for a few weeks, maybe I start to go, oh man, I really wish I were with my brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Maybe I should stop sinning so I can go back and be a part of the fellowship. That was the big picture mindset of what Paul was trying to get around. So it worked pretty well at setting people back on the path of holiness back then, back, back when he wrote this, it was a, a, a system that actually worked. Of course, that was when there was only one church in town, right? And now people's mindsets more often are, well, if your church won't let me sin the way I want to sin, then I'll just go to one of the other churches in town and they'll let me sin the way I want to sin, right? We, we live in a very different world now. Everything's become relative. And so people protest, do not judge me because there is no right or wrong, and you're not allowed to tell me what I'm doing is wrong, don't violate my truth, right? But that's not at all what Jesus or Paul were saying when they say, do not judge. Now remember, several weeks ago I said, in addition to the Sermon on the Mount that we're studying in Matthew 5-7, through 7, Jesus is also known for what's referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. And it's recorded in Luke 6. It's not as long as the Sermon on the Mount, but there's a lot of similarities in the teaching. Uh, very similar collections. And this passage from Luke is really a good place for us to compare what he said in Matthew 7 about judging or not judging others. Let's get some additional context today. So in Luke 6, verses 35 and 36, look at what Jesus says. He says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So you got that idea in mind, right? And we've been talking about that in depth for several weeks now, right? Love your enemies. Pray for them. Be merciful. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. Remember all those different statements. And then with all of that in mind, look at what Jesus says next in verses 37 and 38. See if this sounds familiar now. Do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Let me say that last line again. It's very important. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. That's kind of the big idea of what Jesus is saying in this passage. Essentially the same thing he said in Matthew 7, but he's expanded on it a little bit here in the Sermon on the Plain. In other words, as a follower of Christ, whatever your actions are, that's what you're going to receive from God in return. So if you condemn if you take away, you will be condemned and you will have things taken away from you. Instead, he's challenging us, be people who give generously. And so note we're talking here about things like love and grace and mercy and pardon and forgiveness and second chances. It's not just about gifts or money or other material things. Give those kinds of things and God will give you even more of those things. 
In fact, Jesus says his giving will pour out over you. It will fill your lap. It'll be like standing under a waterfall of God's blessings. So when I read that and I think about that and I pray about that, I'm always reminded of one of my favorite stories of all time. Now, I've read the original novel. I've seen every variation of it in the movies. I've watched the musical version live. And I'm talking about Les Miserables, right? The Miserable Ones in English. It was originally written by a guy named Victor Hugo. Uh, the, the musical version is just called Les Mis, right? So if you don't know the story, I'm going to quickly sum it up for you. The main character is a guy named Jean Valjean. And Jean Valjean is imprisoned for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving nephew. He's in prison for a while, and then he tries to escape. And so they extend his sentence to 19 years. So essentially, he's in prison for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread. And then eventually, he gets released. He has no money. He has no home. He has no job, nothing to live on. And we follow him as he soon meets a bishop, Monsignor Bienvenu. They meet. Bienvenu, literally his name means welcome in French. If this story took place in Hawaii, his name would be Monsignor E. Komomai, right? So this is Monsignor Bienvenu. And the bishop opens up his home to this completely unknown vagrant. He does it as an act of Christian charity and trust. He gives Jean Valjean a warm meal. He allows him to spend the night. And then, unfortunately, Jean Valjean repays his gracious host by stealing a bunch of silver utensils and plates and cups, and he takes off in the middle of the night. Well, he's quickly caught by the police the next morning, and he insists that all of this silver was a gift to him from the bishop. So the gendarmes take him back to the bishop's house to ask if this story is really true. They're sure it's not. This guy's obviously a thief. He's lying. And so the bishop now has a chance to judge him. The bishop has a chance to condemn him as absolutely 100% guilty of stealing from him. But instead, he chooses grace and mercy to Jean Valjean. And he says this, he says, Ah, here you are. I'm glad to see you. Well, how is this? I gave you the candlesticks too, which are silver like the rest, for which you can certainly get 200 francs. Why did you not carry them away with the forks and spoons? And the gendarmes are stunned. They're like, did did, he, did you really give him this stuff as a gift? And he says, yes, officers, it's true. The bishop says these were a gift. And then he tells Jean Valjean, the candlesticks, here, take them. They're going to allow you to keep all of this silver. The police release him because, as according to the bishop, he's done nothing wrong. He does this to help Valjean have a second chance to give him a new lease on life. He just forgives him, a clean slate. And we see a great foreshadowing of what Jesus did for us, Yeah. He forgave us, He declared us innocent, even though we were all caught red-handed in sin. And the bishop tells Valjean then what he expects from him for this act of mercy. And it kind of reminds me of what Jesus is telling us, His close disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. It's what Jesus expects from us. In the novel version, it's always a little different depending on which variation, but in the original novel, here's what the bishop says. Forget not, never forget, that you have promised me to use this silver to become an honest man, Jean Valjean, my brother. You belong no longer to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I am buying for you. I withdraw it from dark thoughts and from the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. So instead of continuing a life of crime, Jean Valjean sells most of the gifted silver, and he does indeed turn his life around. He becomes one of the best men you could ever know. All because of this judgment choice that the bishop made. Valjean never sells the candlesticks. He keeps them as a constant reminder of the grace shown to him, as a constant reminder to be a better man. Isn't that a beautiful story? And so notice here in the Sermon on the Plain, to judge with the choice. We have a choice when we judge, to either condemn or to pardon all who are connected. And the sentence structure shows us to pardon is the opposite of to condemn. And so just as we said last week, in this context, a synonym for the way Jesus uses this Greek word that we tend to translate as judge is to condemn. Do not condemn. Do not convict or you will be condemned, you will be convicted. But that's not always what the word judge means, is it? Sometimes it means to pardon. I'm going to pardon you. I'm judging your behavior, your sin, but I'm choosing to pardon you. That's my judgment in this case. 
And so the big picture here, Jesus says, is you always have that choice to either convict and condemn, or you can choose to pardon and forgive. But both of those decisions are judgments, right? We always have a choice in our judgment. Jesus says, which one are you going to choose? He wants us to know it is in your best interest to choose to pardon and forgive, to give someone else a second chance, just like you were given a second chance by God. And so when Jesus tells us here in the Sermon on the Mount and on the Sermon on the Plain to not judge, he's saying, is he saying it's always a sin for us to judge the behavior of someone else as being sinful behavior? Is that always a sin? Do not judge ever? Is that what he's saying? Is that what he means? Or is he, as he's been doing throughout this sermon so far, saying it's really the attitude of our heart that matters when we're doing the judging? What is the attitude of of our heart? What's the purpose of the judgment we're making? I think we'll find it's that. I shared in week, uh, last week or two weeks ago, Matthew 7, 1, Jesus is using the Greek word krino, right? Krino uh, originally simply meant to separate, but in the context Jesus is using it, we see it means to condemn, to specifically separate something out for condemnation. But originally, we go all the way back to Homer's Iliad, one of the oldest works of Greek literature, and he writes of Cyrus separating the grain from the chaff, and he uses this same word, krino. And so at its very basic core, it just means to distinguish one thing or one person from another, one behavior from another, one idea from another. You're able to pick something out to be of an opinion to judge, right? So if I sort my nickels from my dimes, I am judging all of them. You're a dime. I just judged it as a dime. You're a nickel. I just judged it as a nickel, right? So how about if I start gossiping and you say to me, hey, Greg, you know, the Bible says gossip is a sin, so you shouldn't gossip. What are you doing? You're judging, right? And that's okay. You're separating sinful behaviors from non-sinful behaviors. So who's sinning in that situation? Are you sinning when you judge someone for that behavior? Are you sinning? Are you failing to follow Jesus' command to not judge? No, because you didn't condemn me for the behavior. You just pointed out that the behavior is not the behavior that Jesus has commanded us to engage in. And so we saw in 1 Corinthians, you and I are both commanded to do that, to issue that kind of judgment of sin to one another. Yet we're to do it gently, kindly, grace-filled, right? All those things. So let's look at Galatians 6, because this is another passage that kind of in informs us uh, today. Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, if a person is discovered in some sin, you who are spiritual, you who are not currently sinning, restore such a person, how? In a spirit of gentleness. Pay close attention to yourselves so that you are not tempted to. It's okay to judge a behavior as sin and to point it out and to say, this is not what the Bible says you should be doing, but do it in a spirit of gentleness and pay close attention that you don't become harsh and condemning in the way that you do that because the measure you apply when you judge the behavior of someone else is the same measure God's going to apply to you. And then Paul says, carry one another's burdens. Do it together. Hey, you're in trouble. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. And I'm not just going to judge you and shove you off. I'm going to try to help you get back on the right path. In this way, Paul says, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So he says, if you discover, if a person is discovered in some sin, how can you discover me in a sin? You have to make a judgment of my behavior based on the law of God, right? Crino. If I'm sinning and you become aware of it, and it seems like I am not aware of it being a sin, or if it seems like I'm not convicted by it, or it seems that I'm making absolutely no effort to get free from it, then you should come, Paul says, to try to restore me. Not with condemnation, but with gentleness. But you do have to make a judgment if you're going to pull me away from my sin. And then if I still refuse to repent of my sin, the Bible lays out a series of steps to either finally restore me to the fellowship or to prevent me from being part of the fellowship until I agree to repent of my sin. And all of that requires judging on our part, and we are all commanded to do it. But in any case, we are commanded to do it with a spirit of gentleness, not harshness, not condemnation. So don't threaten me. I won't berate you. Let's not belittle each other. Let's not insult each other. Let's not lord our spiritual performance over someone else's. 
God's law is the standard by which we are to judge one another. Not our own standards, God's standards. And if you do it that way, then you are judging me in the way Jesus is commanding you not to do it. You are sinning by judging if you're judging according to your standards rather than God's standards. So clearly not all judging is wrong. Paul says pay pay close attention to yourselves when you confront someone about their sin. And if you begin with the wrong motives, he's saying you could be tempted to sin, right? If I'm sinning, come to me in love. Come gently desiring what's best for me. Offer to help carry my burden with me. Help me any way you can to restore me to where I should be walking. Notice we come back again to Jesus who doesn't abolish the law. Instead, He fulfills it. Paul says if we follow this example of Jesus when we confront each other in our sins, we will fulfill not just the law of Moses, but the law of Christ, the law of grace, the law of mercy as well. And the caution Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Sermon on the Plain is the measure of harshness, the lack of forgiveness, the lack of mercy you show to others. That's how God's going to show you or treat you in return. So keep that in mind whenever the time comes for you to judge a behavior, to separate a behavior as either right or wrong according to the law of God. And likewise, the measure of gentleness or love or mercy or forgiveness that you're showing others will promise that God is going to return that to you. In fact, He'll even bless you far beyond what you've shown. When you do the right things, God gives you even more of the right things. You can't outgive. God. It's going to fill your lap. It's going to spill over. So that's the correct interpretation of Jesus's command. Do not judge or you will be judged. He's saying do not judge harshly or you will be judged harshly. This is not a verse about not judging good and evil, not judging right and wrong, not judging sin from righteousness. This is a verse about not acting judgmentally toward others when they stumble, when they sin. It's about not belittling others. It's it's about not elevating ourselves. And so think of some of the people Jesus encountered and that He spoke to about their sins. The Scriptures say several times about other people around Him, Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts, said something. Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts. And so you'll notice He always speaks to the hypocrites harshly because they treat others harshly. But he always speaks gently to those who are gentle. Let me say that again. You'll notice he always speaks to the hypocrites harshly because they treat others harshly. But he always speaks gently to those who are gentle. Think of the woman caught in adultery. Think of the Samaritan woman at the well. The woman at the well was a serial adulterer. She was currently living in sin with a new man. And Jesus accepted her anyway. He loved her. But he also didn't hesitate to let her know he was fully aware of her sin. He told her her situation. She was so stunned by that, she went back and told the whole village, come meet a man who knows everything about me, right? And it was the same thing with the woman that was caught in the act of adultery that they brought out and they wanted to see who gets to throw the first stone, right? And he accepted her, he loved her, and yet he also pointed out her sin, remember? He said, I do not condemn you either, Go, from now on, sin no more. He acknowledges that what she was doing was a sin. It was wrong. He judges that. But he also doesn't condemn her. That's what he's talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. And the word he uses in this verse is a form of the same word we've already been talking about this morning. Crino, right? Here Jesus uses the word katakrino, which means to judge against, to condemn, to judge as worthy of punishment. And now it's clear Jesus absolutely did judge her. He said, hey, you've been sinning. Don't do that sin anymore. He judged her previous actions as sinful, but he also did not condemn her. And so in the same way, everybody say same way. If you're watching online, type same way right now. In the same way, we as his followers are in fact commanded to judge sin as sin, but we are not to condemn the sinners. That's where we're going to stop this week. We're going to pick up Matthew 7, verse 3 next week, and we're going to talk more about the nuances of judging according to Jesus. So let's pray together, and then Joel and Benny are going to give us our closing worship song. Father God, 
Uh, we've been two weeks on these two verses so far because it's just such a hugely misunderstood concept in Christianity. So often I hear people just spout that, thou shalt not judge, and they think that just covers it. But there's so much more that we need to understand. And so help us as the body of Christ to be people who love each other enough to give judgment when one of us gets off course. If I begin to greatly sin, may these people here around me love me enough to say, Greg, you're off course, man. You're sinning. You, you shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's outside the will of God. Here, let me help restore you. Help, help, let me get you away from that sinful behavior. May I be the kind of person who does that for others as well. Lord, help us be that kind of body of believers who are able to judge one another with gentleness and help and, and guidance and not condemnation and harshness. Help us be that kind of people, Lord. Help the world see that that's what judgment really means. It's okay to say, according to God's law, that's a sin. That, that's not me violating Jesus' command. That's me fulfilling the rest of the commands that we find in the greater context of Scripture. Father, I pray for all of us who are here today, all of us watching online right now, to just say, Holy Spirit, be that judge for me right now. Is there anything in me right now that does not belong? Is there any sinful thought, any sinful behavior, any hardness of heart, anything, uh, any relationship that I'm not acting properly in, that I need to change my attitude, that I need to change my actions, that I need to change my thoughts? Point that out to me, Lord. Holy Spirit, show me if I'm sinning. Judge me right now and show me that sin so that I can repent of it and I can get back on course and receive all the blessings that you really have in store for me, Father God. Maybe that's the prayer of your heart today too. If it is, you can say, me too. Me too, God. I want that. Holy Spirit, show me if there's ever anything in me that doesn't belong so that I can instantly repent of it and get back on course. And if you're watching and you're, you're not a Christian yet, you're, you're somebody who's been kind of investigating this. Maybe you'd say, I'm, I'm kind of an agnostic or I'm kind of a seeker. I'm just sort of not really convinced that this whole Jesus thing is real. Then I just want to challenge you today to reach out to Jesus in prayer and to say, Jesus, I, I, I don't know for sure that I believe all this yet, but I, I'm just going to challenge you to reveal yourself to me. Show me in some powerful way that all this is really true and convince me. I'm open to being convinced. And if you are at that point where you're saying, I am convinced, then it's a moment to say, Jesus, I have confidence now. I have trust, I have faith that you are who you say you are and that you're going to do everything you've promised to do. So I ask you to be the God of my life. Take your rightful place on the throne of my life as my God. And Jesus, I ask you to be the Savior of my life. I know that you died on the cross to pay for the penalty of all of my sins, and I accept that now, and I confess, I agree that I had sins that needed to be paid for. And so thank you for preemptively doing that and offering me forgiveness, for going to the court and paying my fine for me, and then giving me an opportunity to be in relationship with you going forward. Thank you for offering to be my Savior. Jesus, I accept that offer. Thank you. Be my Lord and my Savior. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you can just say, me too, God. Me too, what Pastor G just prayed. That's what I really want. I want to know you in a personal relationship, God. I want to experience the abundant life on this earth, and I want to know that I have the promise of eternal life in the world to come. God, touch each person here today in this room, as well as those who are watching online. Bless them in the way they most need to be blessed. Touch them in the way they most need to be touched to know that they've had an encounter with the almighty living God, and that as a result, their lives will never be the same. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus.